Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Studio City Neighborhood Council Homelessness Committee meeting for January. And thank you for those who could come tonight. I know it's MLK Day. I hope you had a nice day and were able to celebrate him. Um, and we'll get the meeting started um, with a roll call. So I'm here. Marcia let me know that she was not going to be able to make it tonight at the last minute. Um, we have Shelly Gutenson. Just hi, I'm here. I see you. <laughs> Jeff Hartwick. Here. And Ira Gold. Okay, and Ira is absent. So I don't have minutes tonight. I did learn that we don't have to do minutes for the committee meetings. And so for this time, I did not do them. So we don't have minutes to approve today. Um, I have some, some items for our, the chair update. Some of them are going to, I'm sort of hoping that we have at least one government official, Jason Maruka, is supposed to come by. We'll keep our eyes out for him if you guys could help me. Um, I don't see him yet. But um, first thing I do want to mention is that um, we have a new committee member. And her name is Shelly Gudenson. And Shelly, would you like to just take a second and tell everybody who you are and a little bit about your background? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, my name is Shelly, and I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist and special education teacher. And I've been working in correctional mental health for about eight or nine years now. And uh, so I've worked at uh, the county level with general population and then also um, populations that have been classified as having mental illness and uh, within suicide watch and um, intake. So I went out of the actually being in a facility and I'm operating a practice now that focuses more on re-entry. Awesome. We're very excited to have you and somebody with your experience on the committee. So welcome. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Good, good, good. Um, I wanted to uh, start with finding my notes here. One important announcement. Um, I know if the CD folks were here tonight, I know it's their, their holiday, um, they would have announced this, but coming up is LASA's 2023 homeless count. And I know that's a really important event where we get volunteers to go around the area and do a, a visual count of encampments, uh, people living in RVs, people uh, who appear to be homeless on the streets. Um, it's a really important way for us to get an accurate count and also get resources to our neighborhood. So um, the, the website to volunteer for this, oh, um, the Studio City, portion of this is on January the 24th, that's a Tuesday, uh, a week from tomorrow. It's from 8 p.m. until midnight. And um, there is a website called They Will Count Will You. They Will Count Will You. Um, and you can, dot org, sorry. They will count will you dot org. If I could share my screen, I guess I could put that up real quick if that's helpful. Um, and it's really easy to volunteer to do that. Um, I went through and looked at it to see how hard it might be. And it was super easy. And I noticed that we have 41 out of 70 needed volunteers. So they are still looking for volunteers. Hopefully you're seeing that screen there. So it's theywillcountwillyou.org. And you just click through on this register to volunteer button. 
put in your zip code, says North Hollywood, choose this site. And there you go. So the meetup section is here at the at 4390 Colfax, which is the first Christian church right there. So anybody that can do that, it would be super helpful. I did send the graphic to Brandon today to post on our Instagram. So maybe that will get some eyes and ears for that. So, um, you know, I just wanted to mention a few other things. I'm sure you guys read the news, um, but our CD4 council member, Nithya Rahman, was named the new chair of housing and homelessness for city council. So um, Barry Johnson actually sent me an, uh, an interesting link with an interview with her on NBC News. If anybody's interested in finding that, I can send you the link, but you can also Google Nithya Rahman, NBC News, and see a few of the things that she had to say about how she was going to approach it and you know a lot of it had to do with building more housing and um and a little more density what she called gentle density um not high rises not manhattan but four to five story buildings or putting duplexes or triplexes where single family homes are which is something i know we've discussed as a committee so anyway, she has a new responsibility and I thought that was worth mentioning. Um, a few other things in, in the news with uh, Mayor Bass is kind of getting herself going and has declared this state of emergency uh, regarding homelessness and launched the Inside Safe Initiative. Um, it was shown that they housed about 96 people in Venice this week. Um, I think there's another thousand to go, but that was pretty good pro progress um, compared to what we've been seeing in the past. Um, yesterday, there was also in the LA Times a story about how they'd extended the LA Grand Hotel downtown for another year. It was supposed to close in about three weeks. And um, I know they had housed there a lot of people from Echo Park and people from Project Room Key. Um, I think there's about 480 beds there. So they extended that for another year. Um, another interesting piece of news um, article that actually Scott Mandel shared with me about the care courts, which is something that we've supported, which is a, a statewide program that helps people who are, um, you know, have severe mental challenges with schizophrenia, and you know higher level psychotic disorders, but getting them into treatment, that is going to be implemented sooner than we thought in LA, but maybe next December. So I think it was gonna be even later, but there's a push to get that going in LA, which is, I think, in my opinion, uh, good news. So um, anyway, those are just a few things that are going on that I thought were worth mentioning. I don't know that we've seen the results of a lot of this in Studio City yet, you know? Um, one of the articles that I read said that council uh, member Krikorian is working with Mayor Bass to identify places in the valley that need attention. So hopefully we'll see some more outreach here very soon. Um, and then I guess the last thing I wanted to mention, I'm looking for her name right now, our CD4 rep who, who comes on and is just such a nice person and has been so helpful to us every time I call her. Um, Tiffany, uh, I think it's Zaytunian. I don't see it written down here because I've, I've lost where I wrote it down. Anyway, she's moving to planning and she's moving out of her field deputy position in Krikorian's office into planning. And she is going to be replaced by a person named Denise Shaw. So hopefully Denise will join us at a meeting very soon and we'll start our relationship with her. So anyway, we have more to talk about later down in the agenda, but that was everything that I wanted to mention as an intro. Um, and I guess next thing on the agenda would be for me to take 
public comment on non-agenda items. Um, I guess I should take comment on anything that I just said too. I guess anything I just said is, is non-agenda as well. So if the public would like to make a comment on non-agenda items, please raise your hand and I'll call on you now. Hi, Ira. Hey. Okay, see. So I have know. comments if there's board comments. I have comments for that. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Ira. Cool. So question about the Homeless Council. Last year, um, when I was there, they were having some serious errors with the software company they contracted with. So the software uh, to, to count all the, the, the homeless, to keep records of those counts, were people, people had said that they had reported several, but then when they finished reporting, when they were coming in um, to kind of give their assessment <clears throat> at the end of their shift, the software was registering zero. So there, there was, I talked to one of the reps and, and uh, they said that they realized that there were some serious glitches and they were likely not going to be using that same vendor. So was, my first question would be, are they, do you know anything about that? Are they, have they changed vendors to something that's like accurate <laughs> or is it the same one? I don't know. That's not good news, but hopefully they have worked out some of those glitches. Okay. I, hope I, so. I don't know. Sorry. That's okay. I was just, just curious if you know. Actually, you know what? That's it. That's fine. That's all I have. Okay. All right. So I'm not seeing Jason Maruka. He's from Superintendent Barger's office. He was going to come by and talk to us about mental health stuff. So I'm going to hope he shows up. He did say he would. We'll keep an eye out. Um, moving on down the agenda then, I guess we're on number five and we'll talk about the motion. I have a motion that I will share. Okay, so the first motion is, um, I'll just read it. The motion is the Studio City Neighborhood Council supports Council File 12-1690-S18 to identify funding to increase support for the Winter Shelter Program. The motion further requests LASA to report on increasing bed capacity and expanding winter shelter sites and ensuring equitable access across the city. The motion is also to be submitted as a separate community impact statement, CIS to CF 12-1690-S18. And I would just, you know, elaborate that the motion uh, the program on this part, the program runs from November 1st to 2022 to March 31st, 2023. It can be accessed through the LASA home engagement teams, or a person can call 211 to be connected to a winter shelter. And if a bed is not available, a motel voucher can be accessed. Um, I do think they're going to vote on this motion within the next week or so. The program's already in progress. So by the time we're able to actually present our motion, it'll be probably confirming that we support what they did. Um, and with that, I will open it up to any comment. Do we have any public comment on the motion? All right, any board comment on that motion? No. Sure. Go ahead, Scott. I'll, I'll bite. So uh, looking at the council file, uh, let me just find it right here. It looks like the homeless and the housing and homelessness committee is scheduled for the committee meeting on January 18th. And looking in the uh, the clerk 
comments and communications, what I find very unusual on this one is there's only one public comment from the, uh, only one entry communication from the public and no neighborhood council has chimed in. And the Homeless and Housing Committee isn't even gonna be meeting for uh, in, in two more days. If you don't mind, I'd like to read the, the public comment. It says, this is an emergency. People are dying outside in the rain and the next Homelessness and Poverty Committee meeting isn't until the 28th. Uh, she's saying this because this was introduced on January 1st. So it was uh, uh, January 2nd. So it was 26 days uh, ahead of the committee. Shouldn't expanding winter shelters be a part of the mayor's emergency declaration? If you go into draft motions that lag in committee, you might as well be drafting motions now for summer cooling stations, not drafting motions in mid-December for winter shelter expansion. This is the season that happens every single year for goodness sake, and no one in our city government even thinks to address it until the crisis is in full swing. So I, I think that pretty much sums it all up. I support this wholeheartedly, and I'm probably as frustrated as the public comment. That's not my public comment to the council file. Trust me, I didn't write that. Uh, I'm just as frustrated as that person. I'm sure most of you are, or all of you are, and I'll leave you with that. Yeah. All right, Jeff. Yeah, I think it's kind of a no-brainer. Uh, there should be an evaluation as to availability of um, shelters during the winter time, especially uh, lately with the, the heavy rains and whatnot. And uh, I think it's going to be down to like 39 degrees tomorrow. So, um, you know, the city needs to get on the ball. I agree with Scott and the the, the sole comment to the council file that, uh, you know, the city needs to get its act together a lot sooner. So, yeah, uh, yeah I support this. Thank you. Great. Yeah, it's underway. I think this does just expand it and increase it. So what condition it's in right now, I can't say for sure. But I think um, if nobody else has any comments, we'll go to a vote. Um, Ira Gold. Yeah. Sorry, I'm here. Uh, it took me a second. Yes. No problem. Um, Jeff Hartwick. Yes. Shelly Goodenson. Yes. Julie Houlihan. Yes. And probably I can, the. And vote, by the way. So I'll vote yes. I'm allowed Scott to vote. Landell. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your vote and your comment. I guess the only thing worse than how late the motion is, is how late it will be when we actually get it in, since we won't get it in, won't be able to vote on it this month in our board meeting. So my apologies for that. Um, all right. So the second motion, let me share this. And I'll just preface this by saying this particular motion, I had to read it like 10 times. <laughs> it's very wordy uh, in terms of what the motion actually is. I think I can boil it down to something simpler, but it was, it's, there's a lot of words and a lot of acronyms. Let me read it and we'll talk through it. The Studio City Neighborhood Council supports Council File 22-1475 to coordinate use of state funds granted to Medi-Cal providers in LA County to meet the local needs and goals with regard to homelessness, housing navigation, and mental health services in conjunction with LASA. This motion coordinates the efforts of the California Department of Healthcare Services, DHCS, Medi-Cal Home and Community-Based Services, HCBS Spending Plan, and Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority, LASA. This motion is also to be submitted as a separate community impact statement, CIS, to CF 22-1475. So I, I put in the agenda that this was submitted by Nithya Rama. That was a mistake. I don't know where I got that before, but as I looked back at it, it was actually submitted by Bob Blumenfeld. So um, correction there. Um, the motion addresses the use of a one-time funding by the state of $1.288 billion 
and it's to fund homeless programs through Medi-Cal. And there's two Medi-Cal providers in LA County that will receive about $405 million. And within that Medi-Cal system, there's an initiative called the Housing and Homelessness Incentive Program that the money will go to. So it's a funnel from the state to Medi-Cal to this homeless program. And so what this council file is saying is we need to coordinate that with LASA and see how we can combine those goals. And um, I think LASA has certain restrictions such as the number of times they can do outreach to somebody. And this program doesn't have, have the same restrictions. Um, LASA is also looking for additional money that would help them expand their street medicine and their mobile health, mental health programs. That says, yeah, their, their, their van programs in the city. So they're looking to take that state money, coordinate with the county, share data, share programs, and coordinate. That's what this motion is about. And it seems to me uh, worth supporting. Again, I believe this is, I wrote going to council January 11th, 2023. Did I miss that? Is that wrong? I'm gonna double check that because this may be another case where they've already acted and we're just, again, putting in our two cents later that we think this is a good idea. But these were the only two like current pieces of legislation that we were uh, able to weigh in on that hadn't already been at that moment uh, acted upon. So. Uh, we'll go to the members of the public if you have any comments. Any board comments? I'm just trying to double check this date. Oh, okay, it does say council action final. Let me just see if I think they approved it. Maybe it's not worth it. It was a unanimous yes. So this is done. Um, do we wanna go ahead and support it? I guess I'll take committee uh, recommendations about that. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, we, we should always go ahead and do it anyway, even after the fact. As Barry said, it has instructed me, um, sometimes there are updates to the council file and um, um, changes and whatnot, and, and our input will, will still be there. So uh, it's good anyway. So um, our neighborhood council has its voice heard to, to our electives. So, you know, it, it doesn't hurt even if it's after the fact. I mean, it would be better if it were before the fact, but it's fine. Uh, so we should proceed, that's fine. I'm just noting this motion was made November 22nd and we didn't have a meeting in, in December, but also there's no other neighborhood councils have weighed in on it either. I think it's just the timing of it made it tough, but at least they acted quickly. Um, okay, go ahead, Ira. So I just wanted to express frustration, uh, not over this motion, because I, I appreciate that you in this motion was brought, but the 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 original motion, I'm noticing this this big trend and and the 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 motion that we're voting on, the source of that, uh, it kind of kind of follows that. It, 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 unless I'm not understanding, and that's quite possible, a lot of these motions, especially as it relates to homelessness, uh, is is it mandates getting more information so that we can, we meaning the city, can review and, and see if something else can be done. I'm not seeing lots of motions that actually have action items in them, in there. You know, it, it reminds me of someone who I knew who um, was studying for a, a license in, in a profession and they got the license. And then for that next year, they were studying so that they, after they got the license, so that they could learn how to actually do the job. And I remember having a conversation with that person says, well, when are you gonna stop studying and actually start trying to do it, right? You already have the license. And that person ended up getting out of it because nothing. that person never ended up doing anything. So I'm, I'm noticing my frustration really lies with, within these, these, these motions that the city council is putting forth that really have very few action items and more about, hey, let's just get some more reports and get some more info and gather info um, and, and I'm wondering if this is just 
uh, a continuing tactic to make it look like things are getting done when in fact we're just information gathering and that's it. I'm, I'm, I would still vote for this motion because uh, I mean, it's something, but I just wanted to express general frustration. Thanks. Understood, valid, don't disagree. Uh, Shelly? I have to agree with, with what Ira said. I think I have um, a lot of questions just regarding specifics of what that actually means. Um, what the services would be, who they would be provided through. Um, yeah, yeah. So I guess I just have to echo, you know, feelings of uh, frustration because it there isn't a very proactive approach um, or any kind of specifics submitted with that. Yeah, the motions are generally like one or two pages. Yeah, what so. is the actual programs that are being put into place? I'm not really sure. Yeah. Did you click through and read the motion from the link? It has it has some stuff there that, that you can then like Google or go through, but they are relatively short. Oh, I'll, I'll agree with that. And and sometimes hard to understand. So uh, Scott, go ahead. So yes, I echo the comments that we just heard, and this is another one of those report backs, and everything that seems to be coming is a report back. And it's probably the result of what the uh, LA Board of Supervisors, Janice Hahn, just said when they just declared the uh, state of emergency. She said, quote, so far, nothing we have tried has worked. So the fact is, of the billions of dollars that have been spent, nothing they have tried has worked. So now I think maybe people are a little gun shy and they want to uh, sort of address, at least state some of the issues and then wait for a report back. It's frustrating, but if we, re if we support the report back, then we weigh in again and let's see what they find. So we mark this as something that we're interested in. Our, Council office knows we're interested in it and we're eager to hear the report back and we can follow up. And there's nothing wrong with the with the report back. It's just frustrating that after all these years and all these billions of dollars, uh, all we have is a request for a report back. So I echo the frustration and I support this wholeheartedly. <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay, then we'll go to a vote if nobody else has any further comment. All right, Ira Gold? Yes. Shelly Goodenson? Yes. Jeff Hartwick? Yes. Julie Houlihan? Yes. Scott Mandel? Yes. Great. All right, moving on. Um, moving on to number seven, discussion about possible future motion regarding prison liaison liaisons for individuals leaving incarceration and in need of housing. And just as a preface, this topic was brought to us by Shelley. This is something that she is involved with and a need that she has seen um, in her work. And in just a second, I'll let her talk a little more about it. But just to preface it a little bit, we did do a call with Lorraine Diaz and Tiffany from CD4 and talked a little bit. And they also suggested that we speak with Jason from the county because the county controls more of the mental health services. Um, so we have reached out to him, thought he was gonna be here. So I apologize for that. Um, before I turn it over to Sherry, I did want to, uh, Shelly, sorry, Shelly, um, I did just want to share with you one thing, which is a letter that I got from Hope of the Valley. And I don't know if you guys knew this, but Hope of the Valley is changing their name to Hope the Mission. And they're expanding a little bit. And one of the programs that I saw here is New Beginning for the Formerly Incarcerated. So they're starting a program 
for helping incarcerated individuals find housing. So I think that just reinforces Shelley's idea or her observation that this is a real issue that needs to be addressed. So um, with that, Shelley, I'll just let you talk a little bit about it and we can just discuss what a future motion might look like. Um, I'm most curious um, about what the process is when um, you know, uh, men and women are released from, from jail or prison, um, uh, mainly jails, more at the local level. And they are, they've been classified as, as experiencing severe mental illness. So some kind of psychosis, schizophrenia, um, you know, something that really warrants more intensive mental health care. And, and that would be something that they would be receiving while in jail. And then in my experience though, when it comes time for release and, you know, this is in a different county, um, they are, you know, essentially just, you know, go, go back out into the street with no follow-up care. So you know, that's a, a question I have is for, uh, is how, how does LA County handle that? Um, you know, general population will probably look a little bit different, but specifically the formerly incarcerated that are experiencing severe mental illness, so what options do they have? in terms of getting them set up for transition and feeling like, you know, if somebody, if, if there were, you know, maybe a, a role of a, of a liaison, you know, that could meet with them prior to release to find out what the needs are and what services are available, that transition plan could be completed, you know, prior to release so that it would be just a smooth transition, you know, be picked up, go into you know services if if that's you know what they desire. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm still kind of gathering information. I feel like trying to figure out exactly yeah what what the process is, what happens. Um, George, go ahead. find the question. Uh, my son works for the State Department of Rehabilitation, and one of his co-workers as a bootleg project, you know, it's a project that's kind of unofficially done, uh, goes occasionally to the Silmar Juvenile Hall uh, and talks to people who have been informally told about them, about possible services coming out of uh, juvenile hall because you know people graduate out of there too and my son asked it's like is there is this part of some regular you know uh graduation process where people are you know basically they're you're about to leave uh here's where you can go and there isn't anything like that uh this is where i mean maybe there's something totally wonderful at the city jails but certainly a juvenile hall there isn't um and uh, the on top of that, there is, you know, I, they may not, you know, these people get out, there's no housing for them. So even if, if the coordinators would be there, what housing would they be directed towards? The net result is a lot of these people wind up on the street. So, you know, just to, uh, at, uh, to kind of positively discourage or negatively encourage Shelley, uh, there's a huge vacuum here, uh, which has the additional problem that what you would need to coordinate them with, which is the housing, that's not there. So, you know, congratulations, you found a real problem. Uh, I wish I could say something more positive, but it's just an overwhelming problem for my son's viewpoint. So, uh, it, if what I'm understanding you're saying is that not only do they need the mental health services when they get out, they need the housing. They need, they need, they have dual needs. Upon Basically, leaving. you get out, and there is not everything that needs to be there. You know, you get out, you're going to need a job, you're going to need a place to live, you're going to need mental health, you're going to need food. You know, 
there is no, you know, it needs to be systematic and it's not there. Yeah. Go ahead, Shelly. No, that brings up a good point. You know, that, you know, there, there is a lot of need, um, you know, in my experience, people are more um, open to accepting services, you know, when they are incarcerated and getting ready for release, um, you know, then, you know, maybe it sounds like, you know, some of the feedback that I've heard just about, um, you know, like being approached about services, you know, uh, on the street. So that could potentially be an opportunity to engage more people in, uh, you know, just proactively seeking out the services that they'd like or that they need. So I guess the concept is um, a prison liaison was I think the term that you used that would assist people with this transition. And so I guess our idea was number one, to find out how it's being handled now. And then number two, to maybe make a motion to uh, request that this become a, a position or be supported in a stronger way than it is now. We're not 100% sure how it's being supported or if it is a position, it sounds like it's not. But maybe this is a need that's been identified that we can somehow promote through emotion on our end. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, I think the this is an issue that's actually being addressed by the, the care court system, which is due to be implemented uh, December 1st this year in LA County. And the care court deals specifically with people with schizophrenia and uh, psychotic disorders who are either under the jurisdiction of the criminal system or have um, a family member or a first responder has petitioned the court to, to deal with this individual. So that gives them structure and it actually provides them with housing and advocates and that sort of thing. So there is something in the pipeline. It's just gonna take some time to, to hit LA County and help out with, with the situation here. Um, one problem in, uh, I chair the public safety committee and I'm speaking with a lot of LAPD officers, uh, when we had the park and ride issue where we had about 30 to 40 homeless individuals living at the park and ride in an encampment, uh, they were telling me that word got out that uh, many people released from the jails were got out on the street, that that was a place to go because drugs were plentiful and um, it, you know, laws weren't really being enforced and you could just set up a tent there and, and, and go to town. So um, there's also a problem with the, the jail pipeline that goes straight to many of these homeless encampments, which causes a lot of public safety issues. So that might be uh, another dynamic to look into is to, to whether some people are not availing themselves of housing opportunities or instead looking for areas where, where there's crime and opportunity for that. Thanks. Scott? So while we wait until the county program is put in, I'm, I'm all for Shelley digging into this and seeing what, what can be done uh, absent the, the, the care court, the county program or any other program we, uh, that, I, that I know two uh, previously incarcerated individuals living in Studio City. One is now back behind bars because he committed a, um, a violent felony. The other is living along the river until he commits another violent felony and he's back in jail. These people get released and they go back to the area they're familiar with and they have nowhere to live and they live along the river and they have no way to support or provide for themselves. So they or, or their drug habit, and they uh, lead a life of crime. And the residents here are sort of held hostage to certain areas that they claim for themselves. So I'm all for whatever you, you can come up with uh, to get, I mean, we have uh, people on Megan's list living in the area. People have to live somewhere. So there's gotta be a way. I mean, I think Danny Trejo has some kind of a program that offers uh, previously incarcerated at least work and some way to support themselves. And it certainly is a better option than 
I, I don't know if this is still going through Sacramento, uh, a mandate whereby landlords will not be allowed to check the background of a tenant. So you wouldn't even be able to find out if the person was previously incarcerated because of the lack of places for them to live. And I think that's the wrong way to go. I think there, there should be uh, a programs for these people to enter into society. And it shouldn't be upon the landlords to not be able to check the background or the credit of people they rent to. So go Shelley, thank you. George, go ahead. Thank you, talking that you know like the when when uh, there was already the motion to support a uh, a a a motion at city you know that city hall was going to do is there any way that a motion could be generated to some state senator to propose a halfway house program for because the state does a lot of the crime you know they they hold a lot of the uh, the people who are getting out of uh, prisons. You know, so there's probably more of those than there is people coming out of jails. But it's like almost like a state legislator would need to propose a, a halfway house sort of a program where people could uh, stay until they find some real housing. Um, obviously, the, the Institution Neighborhood Council can't do that. But is there any way that this group could contact a state legislator to ask for a bill like that? Um, well, we, Scott, you might know better than I, but we do communicate with our representative um, from the state. We actually have a new, because Nazarian is no longer there. We have a new person, Laura, Laura Friedman. Laura Friedman will be addressing the neighborhood council possibly in February. Great. I reached out to their office to find out who their new district director is, but I haven't heard back. Have you heard that? Scott? No. Okay. Because they're the guy in the past used to come, you know, and talk with us. So yeah, I think we can definitely have a conversation, but we can't make a motion to the state, right? We're only with the city council. Well, we, we can we can talk about ways around that offline. Okay. Okay. So yeah, I think we can go far, you know, we can always say stuff and see if it gets traction, right? If it's something that we care about. So um Shelly, I had a question, which is uh, you know, Jeff mentioned the care courts, which is um for people who are you know, schizophrenic and things like that. Is that the level of mental health that you're dealing with? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. And services for for that population, especially longer term services, transition services are pretty um, pretty sparse. You know, and in, in my experience in another county, um, you know, so prison is kind of the long term, jail is the short term, and in jail, you're you're stabilized, and um, you know if you are having you know, more of these extreme mental health issues, and then when it was time to go home, you were left in a parking lot, um, you know, with a script for medication that you were going to have no way to fill. So, um, you know, again, that's not LA County, but I'm that's why I'm curious about what the process is here. Yeah, it seems shocking that there's no better transition than there is out of prison that that's a little bit shocking to me that if you don't have a place to go and you don't you don't have any money in your pocket don't you leave with some money from prison am i being just completely naive here you leave with basically nothing it's terrible pretty much what you came in with maybe what a little bit of money um but pretty much what you came in with Okay. Any further discussion on that matter? Shelly and I will continue to reach out. Uh, maybe we can get with Jason offline. Sorry he didn't make it tonight. And then um, 
we can also reach out to uh, Assembly Member Friedman's office. Okay, so we'll move on to number eight. And this is again, just another discussion and it's discussion about future motion regarding the need to shorten timelines for helping homeless individuals into housing. Two instances where the current 45 day enforcement period is in inadequate are encampments near schools, which violate the 4118 ordinance and encampments that are near businesses and interfering with their ability to conduct business. I say 45 day enforcement. I don't know if that's an actual thing, but it is a number that I've heard referred to when I talk to various people that there's rough, for example, when I asked about an encampment on Laurel Canyon, which was close to Campbell Hall, you know, they said, well, it usually takes around 45 days for us to make the needed uh, contact and to go through all the steps that we have to go through it usually takes around 45 days. That just seems too long. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. That seems too long. Uh, it seems like a lot of red tape. Um, the people that we deal with, the police officers, the council folks that we deal with, the LA Family Housing, we've met all these people in our meetings these are great people. We've dealt with them offline. They're doing their jobs they to the best they can, but there's so many rules they have to follow. And it just seems like there's too much red tape and everything takes too much time. And I know that's called government, but it's ridiculous. Um, there's also an example of a person right now that's, you know, living at the at the paper source store on Ventura Boulevard that seems in a lot of distress. It seems like a very stressful situation in, in many ways, not only for that person, but for the business owner, for everybody involved, for people who are even witnessing. It, it's stressful to even see what's going on there. And um, I think there's just too much red tape. Uh, for getting help for this person. So I personally find it frustrating. I'm not sure exactly what we should do, but I just wonder, is there you know, a homegrown initiative, not looking at a, a city council file, but just some way of us collectively expressing how we feel about it and the desire to cut the red tape and shorten this timeline. That's my thought. If anybody has any comments on that. Jeff? Yeah, we might want to invite uh, someone from WASA that deals with outreach specifically and the protocols that are involved in getting someone housing. Um, I think part of the problem is lack of uh, open beds in, in certain districts and whatnot. So that might be part of the equation, but it might behoove us to uh, contact WASA and have them show up at one of our meetings and then give us input about the, the timeline there to get it straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Thanks. I know in our last meeting, there was, we had LA Family Housing come and they'd expressed to us some frustration about beds and that sometimes there were open beds that they couldn't access. And we spoke to Lorraine Diaz about this in our call. Last time she reported, I think there were around 20 open beds in our area. So there are open beds right now. Um, I know some people might not qualify if they're extremely mentally ill or if there's extenuating circumstances, but we generally have open beds. And there, I know there are five that they reserve for their mental health program that they were talking about. And, um, you know, I'd like to see those full. And one of the reasons that Lorraine said they don't like to take people from outside the area is that you don't know how long they're gonna stay. Um, I asked her how long is, is somebody generally in interim housing? And she said it could be months. 
So to give away a bed in the area where it was designated is risky because maybe the next day you'll have somebody in the area that wants the bed. And that's sort of how the system is set up. Um, so I feel like based on when she comes and reports that, that we have beds. I don't know. Um, Ira? She also mentioned uh, catchment zones. I believe that was the that was the the term she used. Catchment zones are are zones in certain areas where if somebody from a different area wants uh, it hasn't been here for a certain amount of time. So has someone from area X hasn't been in area X for a certain amount of time. Uh, they won't get a bed because they're not they haven't established some kind of a residency. Uh, I, I, my memory's a little fuzzy on this. Um, I'll bring this up again later on in the agenda because I, I i'd like to see this agendized uh, um, with with them to come and speak on this and see how we can absolve it but uh, not absolve but to dissolve that catchment zones if it's even possible but i'll bring that up again when it's time thank you yeah Sh shelly is there any kind of network or maybe um like database of nonprofit organizations local to the area that help supplement uh, housing services? Yes. Um, that's actually going to be next on our agenda. There are a couple. Besides LA Family Housing and LASA, I think would be the number one. But to navigate the system, there's the, the NoHo Home Alliance. There's the Hope of the Valley. Um, there are a few that do assist that are local. Um, and we, we can talk more about that in our in our next agenda because I have a little like some more specific information about them. Go ahead, Scott. So one of the things uh, I remember from when LA Family Housing was addressing us was that many people in our specific area, I was trying to drill down on Studio City, and they were telling us that they're holding out for something better. They don't want to go to the uh, bridge housing. They don't want to go to the shelter or the tiny home village. They want a, a hotel room. They want to go to the Sportsman's Lodge. They want a private room, private bath, you know, towel service, three meals a day, and be able to lock their door with no curfew and no rules. I'm sure we all remember during Project Room Key here in Studio City, we were told by Chris Freed from LA Family Housing, there is no curfew. There are no rules. She wants the people inside to do their drugs, um, paraphrasing, but it was pretty much, that's what she said. So now we we do have open beds in our area. And I think to Iris' point, I think he's absolutely correct because there's 15 different uh, sectors, basically all sort of clamoring for their own resources to deal with homeless. It isn't a citywide issue. And that's one of the problems with the way the homeless crisis is addressed. It's 15 council districts all with completely different policies. And you have you know, hard borders as if it's like the Iron Curtain, that things that uh, occur on one side don't occur on the other. And that's perhaps going to be addressed or, or softened a bit with Karen Bass's uh, state of emergency, which they also have now the, what is it called? Inside safe, which goes back to hotels and motels. So I don't know what hotels and motels, uh, I guess to Jeff's point, getting someone back on to address that because that's relatively new, the inside safe. What does that mean for Studio City? Will there be any more Studio City or Studio City or SPA2? There's acronyms for everything. So SPA2 is our general cashment zone. It, it sounds it sounds kind of cruel that it's called entrapment or cashment, whatever it's called. Uh, so we want to see how, how quickly that's working. I mean, Sportsman's got in, into the, the project room key and they, they got out real quick. As soon as the, the upscale uh, shops were opening, suddenly they canceled their, their hotel, which has been sitting empty ever since. And by the way, this hotel motel program, I'll keep harping on what happened right here in Studio City because it happened here in Studio City. Sportsman's was damaged to the tune of $400,000 during Project Room Key. So the, the costs of the inside safe with motel vouchers there's additional costs as well to that because the places 
traditionally get trashed. So I don't know where we're going with this, but I think that there, there will be a way to get people off the street quicker. And with all the report backs and moving parts, I, I don't know if it's gonna be very well coordinated, but there seems to be a ton of money right now. That's all I got. George, go ahead with your comment. Just more of a question. Uh, Julie, you said that there were about 20 beds that were available. Um, and actually the lady at Paper Source is two blocks from my house. And I talked to her. Um, the thing is those beds, are they like beds in a winter shelter with like 40 people in a room or are they in a room by itself? Because most homeless people don't want, you know, they, if, if you have, if you go into a room with 40 other people, you, you arrive at seven or 8 p.m. and you don't know anybody and you're kicked out at 8 a.m., they don't feel very safe. Uh, are those 20 beds like that or are they in rooms by themselves? Well, from my memory, she, she ticked off a few different locations. Um, I know that at the, you know, the navigation center at, at the Hope of the Valley, they're, they're sort of like cubicles in a big room. But we also have, I think, two tiny home villages in our area that are available. And maybe there's one or other, one or two other sites. Um, there's multiple sites in our area. And I think, you know, for that is somewhat of a source of pride for our council members that they created more housing than some of the other areas and so I think in a way they want it to be for people that are in our area I think I'm anticipating what um, I'm still elaborating on on what I was I was talking about because she pushed back pretty hard on taking people from Whittier or from other uh, areas that don't that haven't committed to tiny home villages or to housing, whereas our district ha is, is somewhat of a leader. I, I'm not saying we have the most, because I think other people, there might be people that have more than we do, but I think there's uh, some pride in how many beds we do have. But to have any empty beds, I think right now in the winter and the rain is, not desirable at all. I would love to have all the beds full with people who desirable. I understand for us it's not desirable, but my experience with homeless people is they don't trust other homeless people. So I was wondering if if whoever approached her, that lady next to paper source, yeah, did that person say that there is a room where you would be the only person. Uh, because the thing is, I talked to her. In fact, the, the tent she's in right now is the one I gave her. So uh, it's- uh, I saw you know, that this morning. I wondered where it came from. I noticed It came that. from me. Uh, she was there through several rains, yeah. pretty heavy rains with her teeth shattering. So I got her a tent and I got her some hot soup. But uh, I, you know, the, my experience having talked to her is I don't think she trusts other people. Uh, and that's been the case with a lot of other homeless people I've talked to. So yeah. whoever approaches her, you know, the, the question is, how do you approach her? Some, she's been unfriendly to some people and she's been friendly to others. She's been friendly to me. But if you approach her and say, hey, you know, we have a, we have a room for you and, it, and, and you're the only one in it, uh, you might get a very different response. Incidentally, she may be diabetic, which might push up her priority with some programs which, you know, the thing is that people who are on the list forever until all of a sudden there was another lady who was just at that place seven or eight years ago called Sylvia. And, you know, she lost the ability to speak. She was drooling eventually. Somebody, you know, that she rated high enough that she qualified for a room and then she left. So if let's say a person has a, is threatened, uh, you know, the health is, is fragile then the priority can be raised to warrant a room. And this lady might go if a room is offered. I, I mean, there are solo rooms available. I don't know if one's been offered or what that outreach has been, but I can certainly reach out 
to the council mm. office tomorrow. Tonight, I can send an email yeah. and bring this up. If you approach her in a friendly way and say, hey, there's a room for you, you're going to get a very different response than, you know, uh, you know, there's a bed for you. <laughs> okay. Jeff? <clears throat> yeah, part of the problem is a lot of the people who are experiencing homelessness, uh, they will tell outreach workers one thing. Yeah, I want to be picked up. I want to go to a home and all this. And then when the van comes and, and is ready to take them away, they don't want to go for whatever reason. So there's that aspect of it. Um, I know there are a lot of rules and regulations with the tiny homes. I believe there are two different, there are two cots in a particular tiny home. You can correct me if I'm wrong, um, but you can't do drugs, this, that, and the other. And, and uh, a lot don't want to avail themselves of that shelter for, for that particular reason. And then finally, uh, Scott, did you have an interaction recently with the individual at uh, Paper Source? I've spoken to her a few times as well and tried to uh, find out if she's been visited by anyone doing outreach from either uh, a NOAA Home Alliance or CB4. And it was very difficult to communicate with her. She didn't get aggressive with me. She seemed uh, very curious as I was trying to ask her if she has a cell phone. Many homeless people have cell phones. I was trying to explain that I mean, she really is in need of a shower. And I was trying to explain to her uh, where she could go and give her an information card, but the conversation wasn't going well. And this was, uh, I guess, the day before the tent showed up. There's also a man that, that stays there as well. I don't know if they're connected with each other, but they seem to interact uh, quite a bit. George probably knows more since he's- They are, they are connected. Yeah. And she is, she really has a hard time trusting people, but you know, the man has been actually, I mean, I talked to him and he seems to be quite intelligent. I mean, I don't know how other people react to him, but you know, I, I was looking for her earlier today and he looks at me, saw me looking around and said, can I help you? And I said, I'm looking for the lady who was here. And she said, she's gone, she'll be right back. You know, but you know, I mean, eye contact, everything. You know, I mean, maybe he's high at other times, you know, or uh, again, for uh, Jeff's thing is maybe some other people turn down an offer of a room. But the thing is, you have to ask the specific person, you know, if we gave you X, Y, and Z, would you take it? And they could say yes or no, but some of them will say yes. And I've managed to get another person into a room after they're being on a street corner across from there for several months. Right. So between what George just said and, and my interaction with this person, it, it is pretty amazing that the outreach workers don't appear to be doing their job. Uh, the police know the woman is there. The neighbors know. The businesses know. I am certain I'd be shocked if CD4 doesn't know this woman is there. And that's their job. And why aren't they doing it? Why is George having to bring her a tent and, and, and soup. Why am I there explaining to her where she could get some, some where, where she can get her clothes washed? I mean, she was, it, 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 was, uh, it was quite a mess when I was there uh, yesterday. And these, what I had asked LA Family Housing for is when we see an encampment, when we see a homeless person, when we see someone in distress, there's gotta be a way where we can be informed, the public can be informed, the neighborhood council can be informed that they know about it and they're trying. And you know, the call's already in. Do we do we need to keep reminding the council office of the same thing? Like it, it, there's got to be a better system and where the public and the businesses and such are all informed as to what's going on. Like this person is refusing. And by the way, during COVID, where where um the, the gymnasiums of parks were turned into the shelters that we picture, like after a disaster, a hurricane or something, giant rooms with cots all over the place. That's what was going on, for instance, at Sherman Oaks Park and North Hollywood Park. And there was no shortage of people who were willing to go into the gym at North Hollywood Park and, and have a cot to themselves in a big wide open room with other people. There was security there. Uh, the police were there 24 seven, two police cars all the time. 
and it was staffed and managed. And yes, it maybe may not have been the best accommodations, but in those early days, people thought that they were going to die from COVID. And I guess this this is kind of not making sense. They put them inside in a room, <laughs> all lined up together with blue tarp on the floor. After that program ended, the um, parquet floor had to be replaced. But there are exceptions to the rules where people will take nothing because they're scared or they're mental and they want a private room. And there are others who are just stubborn and say, I want a private room. Otherwise, I'll just stay here in this tent. I'm pretty well situated. I got a, I got a good location under the overpass. People bring me food and, and water and I have uh, uh, sort of all the supplies I need. So there's carrots and sticks. And I guess it, it sounds like homeless just started. This conversation that we're having right now is like well, the crisis just began maybe two months ago, and we're just trying to spitball here and figure this out. And again, back to what uh, what the county supervisors said: nothing, nothing we have tried so far has worked. So he, here we are. Um, Ira. I I'm going to voice an unpopular opinion, but I. And, and I'm and I'm playing devil's advocate, but but I also share I also share this opinion. Um, you know, respectfully, a lot of homeless, and it's not for us to judge because uh, we often don't know how they became homeless, right? Whether through their own choices, whether through um, through no fault of their own, right? But all in all, vagrancy is illegal, right? So when when somebody of seemingly sound mind, and again, that's debatable, right? And not necessarily for 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 us to decide. But if someone with seemingly sound mind is wanting shelter, but they're picking and choosing, that's where beggars can't be choosers comes in. And and my the unpopular opinion that I'm sharing is, if somebody is committing an illegal act, uh, and vagrancy is an illegal act, if they are committing a legal act. And they are offered any means by which to stop committing that act, even if it's just temporary for one night, and they refuse it. I don't care for any reason, right? Unless unless there's really some major things actually going on, like if there's consistently attacks at these shelters, right? That's a different story. But I'm not hearing that. Uh, I'm not hearing that occurring. So I, I, I my opinion is, and I and I really want to. Uh, want to voice this because I, I never hear this this voice uh, is is that they if, if they're if if they have an option they must take it now it's easy to say you can't force someone to take it but I also have a problem with that so I'm I'm very much interested to see what this what's going to happen with conservatorship uh, in the future if that ever is going to pass and what what the um, what would have to happen for that to to for conservatorship to to occur um but but again somebody who is in distress who is of supposed sound mind and offered even a temporary solution should not be able to continue to be on the street and i know there's going to be a there, there's there's a lot of things to say against that i know there could be a lot of debate against that but um but I, I really want to start hearing that voice. Uh, I'm, I'm, I've been pretty quiet on the matter because, I mean, to be honest, you know what happens when anybody says anything against a popular opinion. Um, but I'm getting really frustrated, especially in my area. And, um, and it's coming to a bit of a boiling point. So thank you very much. Thanks, Ari. George? Um, speaking for myself, uh, if it was up to me whether I would sleep with 40 people whom I've met five minutes ago uh, who may be suffering from apnea, snoring, some of which may be on drugs, some of which may be violent, or sleeping under a tarp on a street, I would sleep under a tarp on the street. And I think everyone who is looking at this should take a look at what it's like to be in a, in a winter shelter and ask themselves what they would do. Uh, saying how, what somebody else should do, you know what, it's like, I know enough architecture that, you know, if you would simply put up 
cubicles to visually divide the space so you're not like out in the open. I would not be able to sleep with other people in the room uh, in a place like that. Um, you know, ask yourself how you would do and what is the minimum that would cause you to choose the shelter over the street? Because sleeping on the street in the rain is not fun. Uh, you know, within, there's nobody here in this discussion who is a homeless person who could tell us what it's like. You know, and I've known a fair number of them. And the reason why I can talk to them is because I was trained by a missionary on how to talk to them. It's not easy. They, somebody with the embodied experience of homelessness should be on this committee. Thank you. Um, Scott? So I, actually I can answer uh, one of George's concerns. Uh, first of all, the people who are in the tiny homes and if you go take the tours and talk to Ken Kraft and uh, I forget the CFO's name, it's like uh, Roland uh, something, the, they're very happy. They're pleased with the program. They don't mind sleeping, uh, sharing a, a tiny home with somebody else uh, and they're able to, to comply with the rules. Personally, me, I have paid to sleep in dormitory rooms with bunk beds with dozens of strangers. I've stayed in youth hostels when I traveled. I've stayed uh, up at ski areas that have dormitory style rooms that were very inexpensive when I was younger. And it was not a problem and we didn't have security. And it was better than uh, sleeping in my car and then skiing the next day. So I do have experience where I paid to stay like that. And I, I think also back to Iris point, the va specific vagrancy laws, I'm gonna put my lawyer hat on for a minute and watch Jeff Hartwick uh, grimace. The vagrancy laws were overturned decades ago. So you cannot cite someone specifically for vagrancy. That's one of the reasons why we have the 4118. It has to be a specific thing they are doing, not just being vagrant, being vagrant blocking the sidewalk or being vagrant by a school or, or, or what have you. Uh, and also as far as the, the number of shelters, that's the, the Boise case where we need a lot more shelters first before we can force people to take what's available. And even uh, Daryl Steinberg, he's the mayor of Sacramento right now. He was um, heavily involved in all types of legislation regarding homeless and crime and, and over the years. And he's now advocating for what Ira was, was mentioning, enough shelters, not $700,000 single units, but enough shelters to cover the people combined with an obligation to use it. And at some point, society just can't afford to purchase a private room for everybody who is on the street. I mean, there's tens of thousands of people. And if you just type 700,000 by, Forty or fifty thousand dollars, you'll see what that number is. It, it doesn't work, and if the shelters and the tap, uh, and the um, tiny homes are configured in such a way, and you don't have to worry about the person next to you slitting your throat, uh, I personally would would take. And if you see what happens when there's a hurricane, like Hurricane Katrina or an earthquake, the the people who are displaced are not living in tents outside their destroyed homes. They're inside the 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 is the Astrodome or one of those. I mean, there were some some bad conditions for a little while, but they're at uh, shelters established by the Red Cross, and they're living in community centers. So anyway, I I don't know where we're we're going with this because it seems that this is not this is not something we can solve, but we can make suggestions and and drill down on Studio City and find out why that person on Vantage and Ventura is still there after weeks and weeks and weeks and why the, the county or the city or any other homeless service uh, agency has not yet figured out a way to get this person indoors. And it's, she's suffering and the advocates and the activists all say, you know, it's her right. And it's, it's, it shouldn't be her right to live like that. She's in definite, obvious mental and physical distress. So I don't have any answers. George? Actually, I think this is a very useful conversation, uh, but it needs to be able to converge. Uh, I've been in Berlin and Berlin has 
problems like any other city. Uh, they have housing which is made out of these cargo containers that you see in trucks. They're called ISO containers. And you know, if a mobile home can, can be bought brand new for hundred thousand dollars, there's no reason why one of those uh, containers, like the way the studios uh, have the dressing rooms when they go out in the field, can't be had for a whole lot less. Those things would have individual spaces in them. Um, the I think the tiny homes are much easier to convince people to take than the room with 40 strangers. Also, in a ski resort, 40 skiers is very different than 40 homeless people who are going to have a much larger, larger fraction of mental illness than the people in ski resorts. So there is a whole lot of in-between space that needs to be discussed in a civil way, which is, I think, what this group could do very well, is what are solutions that cost more than a room than a bed in a gym but cost a lot less than six hundred thousand dollars and you know i'm aware that in japan they have these things called cubicle hotels you know there are a lot of things which would be a lot cheaper than what we're doing now but would probably cost more than a cot in a gym and that's a discussion that needs to happen and it doesn't seem to be happening shelly just want to make a quick comment um, that I've been thinking about just listening to these conversations. You know, I think the tiny homes are, you know, great, um, but a tiny home doesn't address substance abuse. It doesn't address mental health. It doesn't address a lifetime of trauma and, you know, other adverse experiences that somebody's been through. So um, I kind of see it as a band aid in a sense where you know, you can get somebody to the tiny house, but if the underlying issue isn't addressed, then how much, how much of a long-term effect is it really going to have? It's a great point. And I do think that some of these motions, even tonight that we were uh, supporting, there's a mental health component in them. And I think that at least the government uh, people who are doing this are starting to recognize that, that housing and mental, um, mental assistance go together in many cases. And sometimes they argue in which order you should get them, but maybe it's both at the same time. I don't know, but I think it's, it's a great point and something that, that we're seeing at least now in this legislation uh, but as you and I discussed, I think we sent out an email about it. There's articles in the paper about how difficult it is to get mental health workers right now for the county, that the county is short of mental health workers that they're creating all these programs for. And, you know, the pay is not great. The hours are not great. So, you know, that's a whole nother aspect to this that maybe we need to support, which which is higher pay and, and uh, better programs for the mental health workers that are putting themselves, you know, out there to work with the homeless population, uh, that they need to be encouraged and they need to be properly paid uh, to do this work. And we need to have enough of them. So, uh, you know, that's another thing that maybe we, we could look at. But just, I wanted to get maybe back to this original, maybe the original discussion is, is not the motion, but I'd like it to be a motion, which is that we need to speed up this process. However that process is, it's too long. 45 days is too long for help. And well, I think I agree with almost everything everybody said, and that includes, you know, Ira, it, it, because I think it's frustrating for um, for people on both sides the stagnant way that this is happening. And I was struck. I was thinking about two things that have been said to us in committee meetings before um, about allowing you know those that that need the help to refuse the help 
And one was um, our senior lead officer talked about the park and ride. And that was a very serious issue for us when we started this committee. It was, there was crime, there was fires. Uh, you know, we lost these, the parking lot. There was just a lot going on down there. And when it was finally decided that they were gonna clear that parking lot, there was the, the residents there had to make a decision take the housing or go somewhere else or don't, but you can't stay here. And what he said was, that's what you have to do. You have to say, here are your choices. We're gonna give you this place, but you can't stay here. So we're giving you an option, but the option is not to stay put. So there's maybe that sort of element of tough love that we're not exercising that maybe needs to be exercised a little more strongly or a little more quickly, because how many times can we reach out to the same people when we're using our resources five, 10 times on one person when there's 45,000 people we need to serve? How many times can we go to the same person? I'm just asking, I'm not sure what that answer is, but, um, Maybe it's not 10 times, maybe it's three times, you know, I don't know. Um, the other thing that I, uh, that really surprised and struck me was when we had LA Family Housing here and they said, Ira asked the question, why we have more people here than you see in Malibu or that you see in Calabasas or you see in other areas? And the answer was because we have more services we have more leniency here. They know this is a good place to be homeless, you know? And that really sort of stuck with me that um, in a way it's a wonderful thing that people are kind and generous and that these programs are here, but is there a limit, a time limit we should put on that, you know, in order to get people help? So uh, those are my thoughts. Anybody else? Okay, well, I guess we'll move forward. Those are good discussions. I guess those, you know, we still gotta figure out how to word that and what to say, why it takes so long, but food for thought, I guess. Um, we'll move on to the next agenda item. And um, I skipped number nine, so we'll just consider that one done, sorry. Um, we have been discussing, we'll go to number 10, which is website information. And we've been wanting to put some stuff up on our website. We have our door, our, our little window open. Is that correct, Scott? Do we have our our page? We, we, this website's been going for, for months. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, I have two things to show. Um, first, I'll just show, Something that Louise Oliart put together a while back, which is called the Fab Four Flyer. Right. I think you guys have all seen it, but I'm going to show it briefly. And this is something that he has used in the past to hand out to people that shows them where they can get services. And um, one is the, the NoHo Home Alliance. Um, you know, there's drop in services for food and clothing. They'll help you find housing. There's different services on different dates. There's also Hope of the Valley, which is now Hope uh, the Mission. They have, this is one place you can go, the Navigation Center. The wonderful thing about the Navigation Center is that it has computers. They'll help you with your resume. They help you find jobs. They have storage bins where you can store your stuff, um, as well as you know the cubicle type beds. Um, that are, you know, more for temporary housing. They have the Alex, I think they now have that new Alex Trebek Center where they took over Skateland, where they have services. There's also the North Hollywood Interfaith Food Pantry where you can get food um, pick up. And then there's the St. Charles Catholic Church. So these are the four local places where you can go to get services. I, I've reached out to all of them because I know there have been a few changes. 
Um, I spoke with someone at the NoHo Home Alliance today. She's gonna take a look at this and just make sure it's all still accurate. But also their website is funky. And if you try to go to their website, you get a piracy warning or you get this generic page. And she did say that there were some transitional things with the website. They weren't aware that their website wasn't working. So um, anyway, they're gonna get back to me, but I should have that information very shortly. Uh, Hope of the Valley, as we discussed, they're changing their name. Um, so I'll just see what they want to have posted real quick before we put it up. The North Hollywood Interfaith Food Pantry has changed locations, but it's, it's just right around the corner. It used to be uh, right if you drive through the parking lot to get your food. Now it's actually on Moore Park. They took over that flower shop there, the D's Flowers, and there's a parking lane. So you literally just drive up and they give you groceries and you drive off. So, and that's on Mondays and Fridays still. So that's the Fab Four Flyer. And I think that in addition to having something like this on our website, something uh, like this that's, uh, that would be easy to hand out for outreach would be a good idea. A uh, small card, maybe it's a, I don't know if we can fit all that on a postcard, maybe in a different format. I'd like to do it in something, I don't know if a flyer, you guys can comment when you have a chance to comment. If a flyer, a piece of paper is the way to go with a map on it, kind of like it is. I mean, maybe there's some good wisdom in that because it does have the map. I always think of something smaller you can put in your pocket. I guess you can fold a flyer. But anyway, I think we should update something like this for outreach as well as putting it on the website. And then I'm gonna show you, um, this is kind of an update of the information I don't know, Scott, do I need to get a graphic designer to do this or will the website people make it look nice? That's my question. Brandon is pretty handy with uh, Photoshop. And okay. he, can, he can take all of this and, and then it would link, you would have it like on the homeless committee, homelessness committee page. Yeah. And it would link to a nice uh, flyer or this, this, I mean, I think the information is fine. I don't know if, I mean, to me, it, it doesn't bother me that it's just text. To just read it like that. I like, I just think it'd be look, we can make it look nicer, but anyway, I, I did go ahead and put those fab four things here, the interfaith food pantry, hope the mission, the St. Charles Catholic Bor Borromeo Catholic church, the NoHo home Alliance. So that if somebody came to our website, they would see, okay, resources for food and for services. Then we have housing assistance. So you can go to LA Family Housing and have some links there. Or, um, and then also LASA, and here's a link to get help that, for housing assistance. There's also an eviction pre prevention program, Stay Housed LA. And then a section about reporting because I think it's very confusing for people to know how to report. And so just a little information, know your jurisdiction. So if it's state and county, it's probably near the freeways, bridges and the off ramps. When requesting help from Caltrans, here's the link. Here's what you can report there. Copy your representative on your report, right? And then city of LA, you do your LA HOP report, um, the Los Angeles outreach portal, which is what we should probably do. I don't know if anybody's done one for the, for the gal at Paper Source or the, the couple at Paper Source. So I'll do that tonight and just make sure that that's in the, you know, registered. Um, so we could have, that could probably use some graphic help just so people go, okay, city state la hop or the the what do they call it? the customer service request there's two ways to report requests for help and that's request to help the person and request and also to 
perhaps, you know, it's for outreach help. So whether it's a cleanup, help, any sort of angle that you're coming at it, it's, it's to request homeless uh, engagement. Um, and then who to copy on your request, because it's always, always helpful to copy the government representatives. Um, then there's the My311, which is really more for, it says homeless encampments when you're there, but I think it's more of like cleanup um, for that. And then um, copy your representatives. I have the representatives names here, and then I have the other useful contacts, which is the email for the for the senior lead officer, the police station, and the online police station information. So this is the information that I've put together for the website that I'd like to submit. I want to get comments on it um, and just see, if, I don't know if we need to vote on it or not, but um, there are a couple of, you know, T's to cross and I's to dot, but it's 95% it's there. Any, uh, George? Uh, actually, what you did seems to be rather printer friendly. If they add a whole lot of graphics to it, it would be less so. So maybe something very close to what you're doing now should be available somewhere so we could print it out because I would hand this out. Okay, good. Thank you. Anybody from the committee? Abby? I, I would like to just um, piggyback right on what George mentioned. I I really like your um, your resources that you put together and work document. And I think it could uh, probably, Brandon could probably put it in a, in a nice design. And I'm actually, as you were explaining all those uh, resources, I actually, it's like I really wanted to have it in front of me so I can start forwarding to, uh, to some people. So I think it could be easily, uh, um, in, in a, I don't know, some PDF format with some cute colors. So it just each uh, resource stands out. So I think it, it could be uh, printed as well, but the website, um, I think it's a great idea as well. Good, yeah, we wanna be able to empower people and say, here, go to our website, you can get all the information you need, right? Maybe in the website, download brochure, and it's uh, just uh, the, the, the PDF, and you know we can actually forward from from there. Great, thank you, Jeff. Yeah, just go ahead and post everything. Um, you know, a lot of stakeholders they don't really understand the process. If a homeless individual appears in their area, you know, how do I report this? And so you know, it's in Caltrans, you do the CSR. If it's uh, City of LA, you do LA Hop, and you do a three one one and you know, reach out to George Placentia, you know, as a field rep. And I mean, it, that's all very useful. And a lot of people don't know how to do that. And it would be great for everyone in Studio City. So yeah, go ahead and post all that stuff. It's great. great. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, we'll go back to the public, George. Um, I like the idea of paper because I can hand out a piece of paper to a homeless person. Uh, like the lady over here, I don't think she had a cell phone. So t t saying it's a website is not helpful to those of us who want to give it to the homeless people. I want something that I can hand directly to them. Sure, that makes sense. And there was a, a walk-in place too, so that's helpful. All right, do, do you think we need to vote on that or is that just kind of okay? That's part of what we're doing as a committee. I don't think it's a vote. I think, okay. yeah. Yeah, I think as chair, as a chair, you, you're empowered to basically deal with your little section of the website. So yeah, just do it. Okay, we're doing it. And y'all saw can, it, so. You can create whatever you want and ask Brandon or whoever you want to maybe uh, spruce it up a little bit. Yeah. I agree that it, being printer friendly is certainly, certainly helpful. I would uh, then give you the keys to the website and as long as you're not stating an opinion about stuff and you're just passing out information you can post whatever you want we have a digital media policy from our overlords at done but i'm the administ administrator for our neighborhood council and you can just go 
if you have a question, just ask me. It'll be posted. I, as I understand it, we can actually post photographs and graphics. Well, we, we can give them to the web corner and they will post them. But I think what, what you want to do is get this a little closer and then offline, I'll sort of introduce you on how to get into the website and you can just post it and then log out and check it and just get a feel for how it actually works and, and sort of fine tune it there. I'd also yeah. like to know with, with all the all these resources, uh, and if we're going to be pointing people to the Studio City Neighborhood Council, next door is where all the action is. I mean, some people don't really care for next door, but I mean, there is a thread with, you know, triple digits comments just on what's going on in Ventura and Vantage. And all it would take is someone to go, hey, here's the deal. Go to this link and you can find out all this information. Or we contact George. CD4 and say, hey, George, has this been reported? Does everybody know about it? And then you can go back to next door and say, I'm so-and-so, I'm on the, the neighborhood council, and I can tell you I've spoken to George and CD4, and everybody who needs to know knows. So you don't need to do 311. You don't need to call uh, NoHo or, or any of the other places, and they're dealing with it. Or, oh, nobody knew, and they just found out about this, and outreach teams are going out tomorrow yeah something something say, along those lines because it's it's there all it's all there on next door it's not on twitter and it's not i, know, on I see it i don't comment <laughs> and, and we could also I do read it by 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 letting people know what's going on and directing them to the studio city neighbor council we'll get more community involvement which is what we want i i agree this is four pages long so i get i think if we're going to do three and a half if we're going to do a, a flyer, you know, it's going to have to be significantly curtailed. So we can put the full information on the site, but if we do a flyer, it's just got to be smaller. So I'll, I'll look at what that second version would look like. And maybe it looks a little more like his Fab Four thing because that was cool. It's just that I have more, I have more on mine. His is more for like, um, it was more for outreach to homeless individuals but this has this just has more so let me put some thought into that real quick okay um abby oh hi so question for i guess scott or maybe billy you can answer so reporting homeless homelessness would it be to george or would it be to jo uh, josh scarcella who's the new hire for cd4 homelessness deputy or both, or just George, and he'll forward to Josh. How does that work? It's a great question. Well, you should do the LA hop and then copy them on it, right? Um, and I usually go to Josh, but I did list all three people in the office. And so you can just copy all of them. But in terms of who I usually invite or who usually comes to our meeting, it's usually Josh. Mm -hmm. And, and just make sure you have the right council district because we're split. So there's still, there are, you know, it's CD2 and CD4. Same thing. Yeah, for, I didn't even get into that. Where's CD2 yeah. and where's CD4? Yeah. On, on my uh, on my map overlay, actually, uh, you can click and de-click the council district and the supervisor district. I'm trying to get the, um, the uh, uh, files, the map files for all the SLOs as well. So those can be clicked in as overlays on and off so you can see who the SLO is. So I'm, I'm working on that right now. Is, is that something that we can put on our website? Or sure. To, to distinguish? I think it's really hard to understand what's what in Studio City between city, state, what which CD are you in? It's like, you know, Although I will say that the CD offices are really wonderful about communicating with each other. They'll say, well, that's not me, that's them, and they'll send it over. But we may as well not put them through that if we don't have to, right? My map overlay is very easy. You can click them on and off. You can zoom in. You can zoom right down to seeing the center line of the, of the LA River where it separates. And can you can actually see the line go down the center of Colfax and see which is CD2 and, and CD4. It's very accurate. Where does it live, your map? I'll send it. Okay. May I just ask one thing? 
whatever you do, you can make it as fancy as you want. But if you have a button that says printer version, I click on it and I have something I can put in a single page, black and white, and give it to somebody, then the other thing can be 27 colors for all, for all I care. Just something I can take and hand out. Right. You don't want uh, 10 colors to yeah. waste all your printer ink. Got yeah, it. I, okay. One page with everything on it. Okay. All right. All right. Well, we're close. We're close. I've been working on that document for a while and we're close. So, okay. Um, if, if there are no more comments, uh, we will move on to discussion number, uh, sorry, item agenda number, item number 11, discussion regarding potential topics for future meetings. So I think Iris said that he has one, um, but George, I will, I will call on you first. Go ahead. Uh, it could be a discussion on maybe where some porta potties could be put, like in some parking structures, and you know, um, because you know, there's probably some, you know, these people need bathrooms. I mean, nowadays even cafes have combination locks in the bathrooms. Mm. Would that fall under the business district stuff? I'm not sure if they would uh, put porta potties on Ventura Boulevard. Would yeah. He's uh, talking about parking. He had them, the, like he had that. them the over, uh, under the overpasses for a while, and they there was <laughs> there were some problems. I'm not going to get into the details. Jeff yeah, has, I'm not sure if that's going to get a lot of support. Jeff, I know what Jeff you're saying. Jeff has his hands up. The, the vandalism and the uh, and the such, and then there, there were other ideas going around with, with bathrooms, and they were uh, uh, a actually a couple hundred thousand dollars a year to maintain. It was turned out to be, I think if you did the math, cheaper to rent somebody an apartment with a bathroom than put in a bathroom. So go, go ahead. All right, um, Ira. Uh, okay, soapbox, um, and then I, and then I have a a suggestion for a future motion. So uh, I've been speaking with a lot of the local business owners, mostly in one area of Studio City, but um, also because of my job, I talk to a lot of existing and future residents, all areas, but Studio City as well. And based on these experiences, I see two sides of our homeless concern here on a local level. Right, we have the homeless. And then we have business owners and house residents. So the homeless, the homeless have advocates, the loudest being the progressive left. And that's not a dig. That's just the loudest voices right now are those in the progressive left who are almost exclusively focused on the well-being of the unhoused, like um, Council Member Rahman, for example. Oh, where are the advocates for the business owners and the house stakeholders who are natively impacted by the presence and the fallout of the homeless? They're, these voices are quiet and, and speculatively, I believe it's primarily because of cancel culture. And if anyone from a quote unquote privileged point of view says anything negative about the homeless, they're immediately villainized and in, in, in many cases, uh, especially with public officials, doxxed. And this breeds a lot of animosity, obviously. So the situation just keeps getting worse. And while well, governments just continue to struggle through this bureaucracy and this activism. And in the meantime, both the house and unhoused stakeholders continue to be negatively affected. So this committee is not going to solve homelessness, but maybe we can make small local differences within Studio City to chip away some of this animosity between the two groups. And to this end, I, I, I'd like to request that we agendize a roundtable to come up with suggestions on how we can do so. So some examples, and it, it now is not the time, this, this meeting is not the time, it has to be agendized. Uh, example would be, I mentioned this before, um, could we potentially fund additional trash collections in um, harder hit areas, areas that have uh, uh, encampments? And I'm not just talking about in the encampment, I'm talking about in the areas, uh, in the neighborhoods that are negatively affected uh, by encampments. Or um, like, for example, in my neighborhood, uh, there's five or six, sometimes seven revolving individuals, um, maybe three people who are kind of residents that are unhoused here. Um, and they're constantly, I'm constantly calling uh, the city for 
trash pickups and I've even had the street sweeper come several times. Um, and I'm not just talking about my area, I'm talking about in, in various neighborhoods throughout Studio City. Uh, another example could be um, installing missing fencing along certain points of the LA River. Again, I don't know if that's even feasible because of jurisdictional issues. What about discussing potential blankets for the unhoused who don't have blankets? Uh, I think that would be highly relevant at this time of year. Um, I, 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 and again, this is now is not the time to discuss these ideas, but I'd like to agendize this for another time. And at that time, maybe we can also, um, we can also kill two birds with one stone and, and bring in our representatives and we can discuss these catchment areas as well. Thank you. Jeff. Hi, yes. Um, I think part of the problem for CD4 is that Nithya Raman um, opposes what Studio City wants. I mean, how many requests for action have we sent to Nithya Raman's office uh, from unanimously passed by the neighborhood council uh, to designate 4118 zones in our area? And she's completely disregarded it. So, I mean, we've, we've tried to plead with our elected representative to, to get stuff done and it falls on deaf ears. So that's always been a problem. In terms of a, a topic for future discussion, I think what we need to look into is the Triple H expenditures. So $1.2 billion in Triple H money um, has been budgeted to house homeless. I think they've built about 7,400 units. Um, I'd like to know, you know how much each of these units has cost the taxpayers. Um, what their timeline is, uh, you know, I want to learn more about actually what, what has gone on with this program. So that might be something beneficial, get LA um, housing on in on this and give us a briefing about what's going on. Uh, because if you, if you build 7,400 units, you know, we have 41,000 homeless individuals. I mean, I mean, how many of those individuals have have gone into the units, uh, how many more are they gonna put online each year, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we need to know where, where the money's being spent. Um, and then finally, I think we need to look into the individual over at the Beeman Park Library. That person has been there for two years and I've spoken to him and it's, it's just not humane for him to be living there for two years. And I wanna know what, what outreach efforts have been uh, done to help this person from uh, from Nithya Raman's office because they do have their own homeless outreach. So I'd like an update from Nithya Raman's office about what outreach efforts have been made to help this particular individual because he's still there and it's been years. And I don't know if it's, I doubt very much that it's, it's lack of housing availability for this person. I think this person just doesn't wanna avail himself of the help. So. But I like a clear picture because under 4118, a, a new amendment to it, you can't camp within 500 feet of a public library. And, he, and he's right there in plain view. So we need to find out what's going on with that. Thank you. We voted for that. Um, OK, so um, I guess if people don't object, I'll go back for one more public comment since George has, has his hand up. Uh, George, I'll give you one final, one final swing. Um, I would like to <clears throat> add something to Ira's earlier remark, maybe uh, a round table discussion, a couple of round table discussions. Uh, one of them would be what kind of facilities can we put up that would not arouse uh, a you know, a complete shutdown, but a community, uh, you know, it is like, if, you know, if there's no support for uh, uh, porta potties and there's no support for, uh, you know, motels, it's like, what, what could there be some support for that would cost less than $600,000 a unit? So it's like, let's have a brainstorming round table on that, that's number one. Second one is, it would be interesting if there could be a round table with some people being invited, perhaps from like the 
UCLA social science department or something as to where the resistance of the home uh, of the homeless to use the facilities that are being offered to them is coming from. Uh, we are all wondering why they don't use this, this stuff, but it would be nice to have somebody who understands the community, maybe even some homeless people explain, are there units which you are not taking? And if so, why are you not taking them? Um, you know, we are here discussing them as if they were living on Mars, but there should be a way to find out why the resistance, if such resistance really exists. Okay, if that is everybody's comments, thank you everybody. I'm gonna move toward to agenda item 12 and just say closing comments. I just wanna thank you guys for a great discussion tonight. Um, you know, it's a tough topic. I think the, the door is always going to be open for more discussion and more action. And thank goodness things seem to at least be moving forward somewhat. We'll keep a close eye on it. I'll try to follow up on everything that we discussed tonight. And I want to thank you all for coming. So with that, I move that we do I have to move this. I think we can just close it or all in favor of adjourning the meeting. Say Second. aye. Thank you. Aye. <laughs> all right. We'll see you guys next time. Thank you so much.